please a round of applause for our guest here. Gail is, and Alex, they are with us. And uh, at the beginning of uh, this panel discussion, yeah, he is here. <laughs> uh, we will start our uh, talk with a simple question. How you come up with the idea to make a movie about YouTube? The same question for you and for, for Alex as well. OK. Well, as it turns out. Just a second. I need to unmute the, on the microphone. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, as it turns out, uh, the very first person interviewed in the documentary, Steve Chen, is is a friend of mine. He's the chief technology. He was the chief technology officer um, at YouTube and one of the three co-founders. And it seemed to me that there had been a lot of scrutiny for Facebook and I still call it Twitter um, and uh, and other platforms. But somehow, the most important platform uh, in the world had, had very little scrutiny. And, um, and then I connected with Alex, and I will turn it over to Alex. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for having us. And uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Great. And. Uh, uh, Gail, good to see you, uh, oddly, on the other side of the Zoom box for a change. <laughs> um, I wish I could be there in person as well. Uh, the, uh, the, I guess the shortest way of putting it from my end um, is that uh, this is, I guess, my fourth uh, doc feature documentary around the rise of, of the internet um, and global uh, sort of internet-based communities. So. Because Google is the largest, um, in terms of user interaction, the largest uh, technology company on the planet, and it is YouTube is really its media the front, Google's media front end. It felt, to Gail's point, way overdue to tell the story. Um, that being said, I wasn't uh, I wasn't quite sure when the exact right time would be because they were expanding so rapidly. Um, and Gail approached me about collaborating on this with her and it felt kind of like um, sort of a sign to kind of, you know, roll up our sleeves and, and jump into this. And it turned out to be fortuitous, I think, because the, the world events that transpired uh, from COVID to the, the Trump, uh, real, uh, uh, Trump election, uh, the Trump campaign, I mean, of 2020, um, and uh, a lot of events that were going on around the world that YouTube had a huge part in influencing, uh, it ended up becoming a, a perfect backdrop for recounting the story. So I'm very glad that we, that we just uh, took the plunge when we did. But what was the hook, uh, the, the radicalism that you saw on the uh, videos, well, the, the misinformation, fake news. It, it really is everything. As as uh, it just Alex, so you know, um, in order to start on time, they haven't finished the film yet. So please stick around to finish the film after this Q and A is over. Um, but um, it, it really was important to understand how YouTube started. Mm -hmm. So it's not a documentary that's just about radicalization or just about misinformation. What is YouTube? How did it start? What did the what did the creators intend? And why has it become so, what it is now? And the, the truth is, um, it's very much about monetization. And that was not the intent of the original creators. Um, but when you are a shareholder um, owned company, uh, you need to justify your bottom line. You need constant growth. And as it turns out, the best way to attain growth is through keeping people on the platform. And the way to keep people on the platform, as it turns out, is not pet videos. It's not, it, it's not things that make you happy. It's things 
that make you angry and rage. Um, and, uh, and, and that's the way that they are successfully monetizing the platform. And I, I do have to say, there ha they have tried to, um, to be, I think, better citizens about it. Um, but um, but it's, it's, it, it's still frightening. Um, Alex, I don't know if you know this, but uh, the state of Montana has just decided to make Prager University the only textbook provider for the entire state. Yeah, I've been reading, I've been following up on Prager. I mean, I think, I think, uh, I think in, to some degree, uh, in some little ways things got better um, in that YouTube did some work on the recommender algorithm and, and made it less easy to get a uh, rabbit hole, meaning that you go on the site looking for something fairly benign and end up getting pulled into something um, very dangerous and, and insightful. That being said, there's an enormous amount of, pro of propaganda, monetized propaganda on YouTube, an enormous amount, and they are not uh, doing anything tangible at the moment to, uh, to remove that or to counter it. Um, in fact, they're just letting, it's kind of a free-for-all of, of um, election fraud disinformation in the United States right now on YouTube and, and I would argue you know around the world and um, with all of what's going on geopolitically right now uh, it's a free-for-all and it's and it's you know I think it's largely non-ideological on, on the part of Google to the degree that they're profit driven and uh, they don't want to lose it's the same thing we've seen with Meta and other companies where they don't want to alienate um, any area, any money profit making area of their de of their demographic, and as Gail said, uh, a lot of the very salacious, heated kind of yellow journalism type content is what uh, provides the most ad revenue. So um, it's, but there comes a point where a lack of ideology um, still is an ideology <laughs> because if you're if you're your company is is in the business of monetizing propaganda um, that is especially harmful to marginalized communities and you know democracy um, and democracies around the world. Um, that you are you know either uh, you are absolutely complicit in the rise of certain dangerous ideologies, and I think that's something. I don't know where you stop the movie, but I think that's something that we start to get into um, in the back end of the film. Uh, in one sentence, as you uh, mentioned in the movie, uh, YouTube, it's not a mirror of a society. It changes society. It influences so much the society and uh, make that kind of a, uh, ch chambers uh, in the society that can raise those uh, things. Yes, and, and the thing is that, um, you know, people believe what they see. You know, the, we have people in the documentary when you're watching YouTube, someone is talking directly to you. Um, so it's, it's much more influential. It, it seems much more personal. And, uh, and it has a much greater impact. Um, and it's, it's harder now to, to check sources. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what are facts? You know, the, the whole idea that there's such a thing as alternative facts, what is truth, what is real? What is science? What is anti-science? Um, it's people begin to to follow what supports what they want to believe, as opposed to any search for the truth. Uh, guys, how YouTube influenced us here in North Macedonia? So, what's the question? Oh. I think he, she's asking the audience. Oh, okay. Do, do we have any volunteers? Uh, how YouTube affects us here in North Macedonia? If anyone wants to speak, just raise your hand and I will throw this. It's called a catch box. It works like a microphone, so you can use this. That's, that's, it's working. Yeah. No worries. Or you can throw. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Yay. Yeah, please. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I guess in logistics, sorry, can you close the uh, okay. uh, yeah. uh, I guess in uh, here in North Macedonia, we're most uh, affected, uh, and I put the social media affected most about uh, external affairs, I guess, uh, what's happening around the world, especially uh, in negative news, and it's sort of like it sort of mixes polarized. Uh, against the current thing, or it's the rider for the, the current thing, and it, uh, and it moves so fast, like controversy, controversy happen, happening, that it, um, it makes you, it doesn't even give you time to react. You just see, it's like seeing a, it's like a sort of a reflex at this point. You see the choices, and you have to instantly add your subscribe to one or the other, and you don't have enough time to process what's going on. What's going to you? What uh, make it happen? So I guess, um, I guess, yeah, foreign, uh, foreign affairs and uh, geopolitical stuff. Okay, the girl in front of you. Uh, thank you. I think uh, we have a lot of influence from the internet or media in general because we all spend at least six hours on our phones these days. And I think it also reflects that uh, the politics that uh, go around in the USA and in different countries, they do have a giant reflex on our politics, like we move faster and faster, I guess, because uh, we, bring, we see new ideas from different countries and things, we can find different communities, and that's not a thing we can find in our country, we're not that diverse. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, that, that's exactly, I think, what, what Alex was saying, is that the great thing about, about YouTube is that you can find a channel like Natalie Wynn's ContraPoints, even if there is not an LGBTQ community. And if you're interested in that, that's a, a, where you can find it. But as the gentleman also said, um, it, is, it is really pushing polarization. And you know, the, the goal is not to bring people together, it's to create different silos, um, and you continue to, to feed into those silos, and the, I'll, I'll, you know, and I, I'm sure Alex can speak about this, but the recommender algorithm uh, wants to keep you, keep you in that particular world, which is often a world that is more and more polarizing. Maybe he wants to add something? Okay. Um, I mean, I, I think that, that sums it up. I just think that the, the um, you know, as, as Gail alluded to earlier, the, the, the parasocial nature of, of the, the relationship that you have to the people on the platform um, combined with it, an algorithm that is, that is feeding you very specific type of content is a, a combustible, and specific um, uh, uh, situation that's really unique to YouTube. Um, you get it a little bit on TikTok, but the videos are much tend to be much shorter, so it's harder to form um, real lasting bonds with a lot of, of the the people there. Um, but you know, to to the point that's already been raised, there are, there's a lot of good, a lot of people doing good on on YouTube that. Um, that you can find that can help pull you out of some of these, but you have to be active in order to do that. It's it's and a lot of people who uh, their relationship with YouTube um, and a lot of these uh, platforms is very passive, so things just happen to them, um, and then they just get influenced and they don't even sort of think uh, or know to explore um, solutions. I think what happened with Caleb in our film is is relatively unique, where he was really eager to try to find. Um, uh, other points of view, and so he did. Uh, we have a raised uh, hand here in the audience. Good evening. My name is Tanya Yovanovska. I'm the principal of the school. Uh, it's a economic and law school, and I'm here to support my students because. Uh, in our school, we have a new profile. It is e-commerce and digital marketing. I think that um, 
my students and my colleagues especially uh, uh, share the opinion that digital, digital uh, literacy is the part of the menu literacy and uh, for me uh, it means improve the entrepreneur skills and uh, uh, improve the knowledge uh, not only on in the field of economy, law, democracy and uh, I think that the young people uh, must uh, get uh, 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 must find a uh, way how to uh, uh, struggle with the fake news and I think that the educational system in uh, especially in our country supported by all programs from the US Embassy is very important so I'm here as a formal person in one day formal group which is very for me is a wonderful experience thank you very much thank you very much for joining us tonight uh, we saw so many content creators in uh, the video uh, we have a, a different uh, point of view of the YouTube story in the video from lawyers to to father who lost uh, his uh, daughter journalist uh, in the video uh, we have as I mentioned different uh, uh, content creators how do you choose the speakers in the video that uh, is that is an Alex question uh-huh um, you know, we wanted to, uh, to do two things. One is the most important thing um, that we wanted to do was, was to find uh, uh, people, characters, like you would in a narrative film, right? It's a, a cast of characters. It's, it's an ensemble cast. Um, you want people who uh, are human and open and honest and vulnerable and impacted by um, the issues that, that are at play, that have a relationship to YouTube. Um, that's why I didn't want to see experts. Uh, we only hear the experts. Um, uh, the, the people that we see are not, some of them aren't experts at all, uh, but they all share um, a very deep personal connection to uh, YouTube, and it has had a huge influence on their lives. So. Um, and then you find a, a, as you kind of begin to craft the narrative, you find people who uh, interweave with each other, the way Caleb and Natalie are connected, um, the way Carrie Goldberg and Andy Parker are connected. Um, and I think those connections are important because I think with stories about the internet, uh, it can feel very uh, cold and unhuman. Like it's just, it's just keyboards and text and you don't know who's behind the, the keyboard. Um, and when you tell stories about the internet and when you begin to research the internet, unsurprisingly, you discover that it's just people, right? And it isn't really an algorithm. I mean, sure, there, is, there are algorithms, but there are people programming algorithms. And there are people with incentives that are program, programming algorithms. And, when, and whenever uh, you deal with these um, kind of trying to convey uh, the essence of, of the issues and the, the technologies around these platforms, I think the most important thing to do is to show that it's about people at the end of the day. And uh, that was very important with YouTube because YouTube, as you just said, is such a giant topic. Um, and I think that the reason that Gail and I uh, were a good team <laughs> is that we both had a very specific agenda um, that was the same agenda which was focusing on certain aspects of YouTube and not attempting or even being interested in trying to tell every single story within this massive media platform. There's a very specific story that we're telling um, about a very specific uh, area of influence that is probably, in our opinion, the most important area of influence. Um, and that also determined what characters that we went after, um, including who at YouTube we spoke to. It was important that they have something to say. And it was it was helpful that Steve is as smart as he is, Jen, and I don't mean an obvious, obviously you have to be smart to do what he's done, but 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 honest and and engaged and interested in in the implications of a company that he had so much to do with creating. Um, same with Susan, I think she's wrestling with a lot because she's been around since the beginning of Google. Uh, so it wasn't important to go talk to everybody at these companies. It was important to talk to people uh, who were immersed in them in very specific ways in, in the company. But how do you uh, digest all those all these stories? Having in mind that you're, for example, father of a 
three kids and those kids are pretty much on that age and they're addicted on YouTube. How you digest all these stories that you heard during the shooting? How did we get what of the stories? I'm sorry. How did you digest all of that? I mean, you know, I, I think people would be surprised how many hours of footage you and the editors went through. Oof. Um, yeah, oh, okay, I totally understand that question. Um, on, on every documentary, um, I, and I think specifically because we make, we tend to make very topically oriented documentaries that deal with geopolitics or deal with technology or deal with, we always go down a rabbit hole on every film. Um, and that's good and bad. It's good because there are such topics that you're interested in um, and you get to learn more about them and meet you know, the people who are at the center of them. Um, and it's, it's bad in that you get very uh, emotionally and psychologically uh, overloaded. And that was absolutely the case with this. My editor, Wes, and I, and my team, we must have, we looked at, you know, I mean, realistically, we looked at hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of YouTube content, which is too much. <laughs> too much YouTube for anyone to look at. And we looked at a lot of stuff that nobody would, you know, ISIS beheading videos, and I mean, just stuff that we would never have put in that's very gruesome or, uh, you know, negatively impactful. Um, and you just have to, you just, that just comes with the job. But it's not the first time that that's happened to us on a job. But uh, there was a, a period of time from when we finished the film to when the film was released at Tribeca, premiered, and then again from when it premiered at Tribeca to when it came out. And I certainly took that time to not touch this movie or this topic. Like I, so did my editor. We went cold turkey. Like I literally took a deep breath we went on this tour and we started to release the movie over the summer and kind of reoriented myself. But I had not looked at anything to do with this topic in a long time in order to kind of re recalibrate mentally. And how was the rough cut of the movie? It was the same like uh, the first ro uh, rough cut that yeah. you have from Roger Corman? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've gotten a little better at doing notes. Um, <laughs> thankfully, I think Alex appreciated the fact that they weren't as embarrassing as my very first notes for Roger Corman. Um, but um, but it, it really was, um, a, a, as opposed to major surgery, um, it, the, the first cut was so good, so close, that it was minor tweaking here and there. And, uh, you know, and Alex is always great about listening. And many times what you discover as, as a producer um, is that any part of a movie that you've seen um, that a director has given you the, the cut, um, you'll have a note but it's not necessarily a note about that particular scene. It may be something that was earlier or it's something that hasn't been paid off. And Alex and the editor were, were so great about figuring out what the solution was, even if I could not necessarily identify what my problem was. Yeah, they're collaborative. I mean, the, you know, Making films, I've been making films a really long time, and it doesn't matter what form format you're in, whether it's narrative or doc or whatever, or even whether you're acting or directing, it's collaborative. And um, I think, doc, I mean, the only thing I would say about what Gail just said is documentaries are really about listening, anyway, right? Which is really when you when you train as an actor, which is how I started. That's what acting is. Acting is about listening. That's a hundred percent like the core thing you need to learn how to do is is listen. Um, and in a doc, you really need to listen. You need to listen to your subjects and your team. Um, so it's something that I think it, it tends to attract people who are who have an interest in listening, whether they have a skill in it or not. I don't know, but but you have to have an interest in listening because you're doing a lot of listening when you make a doc. Uh, guys, I have so much questions to ask, but I would like to open the floor. Uh, you can ask uh, Gail and Alex. Uh, to, you can comment the movie. 
We have raised hands, please. Mm, where is the... Are, are any of you here aspiring filmmakers? And if you are, can you raise your hands? Great. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can. He wanted to know if, you know, if YouTube could promote more positive values, um, uh, and objective um, channels as opposed to, um, you know, it seems to be rife. It's a really, yeah, it's a really good question. A lot of people are asking that question right now, all over the world, and a lot of people in the United States are 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 pushing. YouTube and other platforms to um, to promote more objective content. I've got to say, I'm seeing the exact opposite happening in practice, where they do less objective content. Um, there is a, an enormous amount of medical disinformation on YouTube, an enormous amount of political disinformation on YouTube. They just stopped moderating. Uh, election fraud and conspiracy theories on YouTube just over the last few weeks, right as we head into an election season. Um, they don't appear to have any incentive financially to do that, to do what you're suggesting. Um, and they, they tend to kind of hide behind this misrepresentation of the First Amendment or of, of free speech that, oh, they need to let everyone have their say. Which is disingenuous because really what they're doing is they're they're, they're wow promoting, did we did we say uh, something to make everybody leave <laughs> propaganda um, and because it makes them money <coughs> so at the end of the day that's where they're incentivized they're incentivized to make money they're not incentivized look at what Musk is doing with Twitter right now um, especially in the in the midst of this this crisis in the Middle East is they're pumping more propaganda more disinformation um, and he's doing that uh, I mean, he's doing it for many reasons but one reason is that it's a kind of greedy desperate uh, attempt at making as much money for that platform as quickly as possible because he knows that it will drive eyeballs to the platform and that will drive ad revenue so it's very cynical but it tends to be what drives these platforms so so as you're probably aware there is much more of an incentive right now in the European Union to have more platform responsibility. And so there's the DSA and there, uh, uh, there's a number of other um, topics that they are trying to, the, trying to legislate. However, the problem is when you have billions up of content uploaded to YouTube, every day, um, how do you police it? How do you enforce it? And I think, I, I do think though that the EU is going to be a leader in this. Um, and, 
and it's going to be very difficult for all of these platforms to have one version of their platform for the EU and another for everywhere else. So, um, so I, I, I do think there's hope, but uh, but there there is no money from what I've heard um, to to enforce um, to enforce the DSA. So, talking about uh, hope, can we count on media literacy? like a hope for this era of propaganda, misinformation, radicalization? Well, you know what, I, I, I loved hearing the, the professor talk about media literacy. It's absolutely essential. And um, Alex and I both attended the Cambridge Disinformation Summit in July, which is, uh, which is leading researchers in disinformation talking about media literacy, how people can be inoculated, how people can be trained to identify, um, um, you know, bad actors, content that is misinformation, um, but, uh, but with deep fakes and with, with, the, with, um, with, with so much AI generated that is going to be very difficult to distinguish. I mean, in, before we could figure out pretty much what a deep fake was. Now it's going to be harder and harder. So it, it really is about you know finding trusted, trusted news sources, and that's getting harder and harder. Yeah, I think that there's a, a there's kind of a two pronged thing that needs to happen. Where you know to get a point, more regulation, legislation, governments getting involved, really thinking through effective means of, of dealing with these issues at the same time and putting pressure on the companies, right, themselves. That's really where the primary change will come is from um, policing these companies because they will not police themselves, which is what primarily we're currently allowing them to do, which means they're not doing anything. Uh, but there is also responsibility um, and there are actions on the, on the public that can be taken um, I, it just takes more work in today's world to find facts, to, to get to the heart, of, to figure out which journalists, which outlets, which people are are presenting actual on the ground facts and who and who yeah. isn't, um, and focusing on them. And that can be done. Um, you know, the world is actually far smaller in a couple of ways than we get overwhelmed, right? But there's really a, there's a handful of really great outlets and, and journalists out there around the world doing good work that are not that difficult to follow. And just the same, there's really only a handful of the worst of the worst influencers and bad actors on these platforms doing <coughs> most of the harm. You know, like Prager, um, and I don't need to start naming names because we all know who they are, uh, but we're really heavily funded, huge megaphone, lots of noise, just pumping out garbage. Um, so I do think that that more initiatives to, to, to towards education, towards media literacy, towards focusing on and shining a light on people who are actually disseminating facts. Like when the Middle East crisis broke out over the last few days, I immediately knew, knew where to go to figure out what was going on, right? And I went there and I figured out what was going on. It wasn't very difficult. You know, it didn't take me very long. There's like four or five people that actually usually know what's going on in that part of the world. And I followed them all and I just listened to what they had to say. And I did more research from there. Um, but you, but that's an active engagement with that. That's a, a kind of a, an incentive, personal incentive to follow that. And I think that that needs to become more of something that is taught. Um, so that people, you know, younger people coming up just don't feel overwhelmed by the noise. When, when, I, uh, when I knew I was coming here, I decided to, um, on uh, YouTube and on, on Twitter, look up, the, look up the Balkans, look up situations going on in this area. And the amount of misinformation shocked me. Because sadly, in the United States, we don't hear much about what is going on here. Um, I have, I have friends who were, uh, who were in the Air Force in Kosovo. When I asked people in the US, did they know 
that we had Air Force in Kosovo. Not one person knew. And, 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 that is, and, and that's a war that we participated in. So I, I think the thing is that you can find out information, but in the US, much of the world is a desert to us. We, we don't get information, we don't know what's going on, and, um, and, and that's one of the reasons why I very much wanted to come here, to basically say, you know, there are those of us who, who feel deeply about areas of the world that, um, and, you know, that, uh, and countries that often get overlooked. And um, so I'm, I'm very grateful to be able to be here and, uh, you know, and to, and to talk with you in person this evening. Thank you very much for being here in Macedonia. I hope that you will enjoy uh, these two, few days yes. uh, here in our country. We would like to invite Alex to come visit us. <laughs> uh, I want to. Yeah, I, feel, I think that it would be a good experience, life experience. <laughs> uh, we have uh, one more question. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask, uh, why specifically about YouTube? Because we have other people then, then I suggest you make that documentary. Um, you, you know, once again, as we said at the beginning, we felt that there has not been a light shined on YouTube. When, when you pick up the newspaper, there are editorials galore about how terrible Facebook is, how terrible Twitter X is, and YouTube has not been under the microscope. And we felt it was very important to, to not give them a pass because they're actually much more influential, much bigger, much more important um, than the other platforms, especially because the number one most visited site in the world uh, on, on the net, on the internet is Google. The number two is YouTube. And they're both owned by the same company. Yeah. But I'll, I'll let yeah, Alex talk. Yeah, I, would add, I think that's absolutely right. And that, and that, I think, is of primary importance is, is that there are two things. One is exactly what Gail just said, which is, is extremely important, which is that because Google is so powerful, they have, they have more lobbying power than any other company um, in Washington. And they have kept everyone off their back. Um, all you ever hear about is Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. TikTok is a huge focus of criticism in the US right now, largely because they're owned by the Chinese, and America will, will, is always happy to point fingers at the Chinese um, at, without wanting to point fingers at itself. So uh, the, which leads to the second point, um, which is that, which is scale. YouTube is significantly larger than any of these companies that you're talking about, substantially larger. There are 4.6 billion plus views a day on YouTube, nowhere near that on TikTok. I mean, nowhere near it on TikTok. Um, so you're dealing with an engagement with the entire planet of video, of parasocial relationship, um, a very strong parasocial relationship bond, eyeball to eyeball, that is more pervasive and I would say probably more influential on a fundamental level than anything else, any other media platform on the, on the globe. And no one's talking about it that way. And in fact, most of the time in the US when you see, uh, or I'd say even globally, when you see criticism of social media, YouTube is not even mentioned, or if it is, it's just way down the list. Um, and I would say it's, it's one of the strongest, if not, if not the strongest in terms of its influence because of its scale, because of how many people are engaging with it on a daily basis. Um, and I just think it was really important to at least add this piece to a much larger conversation. It's not to say there is nothing else that matters. Obviously, there are other things that matter. Uh, but it was to, to hopefully uh, put a pretty strong foot uh, down, you know, through the door uh, and shining a light on, on YouTube where it wasn't happening so much before. Thanks. Go ahead. Okay, um, I want to ask since the documentary is uh, about the YouTube effect, which uh, it's basically about YouTube spreading the misinformation or at least promoting it. And, uh, uh, 
given the company's priorities to make a, a profit. Um, I want to ask, since a lot of red wing and red pill YouTubers that are moving to other platforms, uh, such as uh, Twitter, Gig, Rumble, whatever, um, do you think the YouTube effect has died, has stopped? And uh, what, since you uh, talked about uh, the, the truth uh, multiple times during the, inter the, during the course of this interview, um, what is the truth and where can we find it? Since YouTube is uh, promoting misinformation. It, it's, it's not promoting only misinformation. Um, and uh, the, the thing about YouTube is there are good actors, and I don't mean like performers. I mean, there are people who are there who want to keep you informed and tell the truth. Um, it's just it's just that they're all given equal say. And um, and in, in addition to that, um, you know, the there is more monetization to be made from um, from people who are are pushing a particular agenda. Um, and the thing to remember is that even recently uh, people who go up in the United States and elsewhere, because we start with Christchurch in New Zealand, um, that mass murder was radicalized on, on YouTube. Uh, someone who went into Buffalo, New York, and specifically to kill African Americans, uh, was radicalized on YouTube. So it has, it, it really has an, an enormous impact. Um, much more so than, than these, you know, the, these other, um, these other channels. Um, yeah, yeah, I would just add that, the, that, you know, the YouTube effect such as, as it is in, in what we're describing is, is alive and well and expanding all the time. Um, and, uh, sure, there, there are right-wing, terrible right-wing people going off on these other platforms, but those platforms like Rumble, um, that you're talking about are tiny. Um, there's not that many people on those platforms, and they're all they're preaching to the choir. Nothing particularly dangerous about speaking to your little silo of, of you know, uh, of the, the people who share your ideology. What, what's dangerous about propaganda is the people that get radicalized who did not previously share your ideology, and the ability to weaponize whole huge communities around the world. Um, and indoctrinate them to your ideology. That's exactly what the YouTube effect is, in its essence, is uh, when you're dealing with a media platform that's as big as this, that that where the, the owners of the platform refuse to put in any, any safeguards into their product, uh, then you have an enormous amount of people, millions of people, um, you know, billions you could argue, who are being exposed to propaganda. Um, and that's that's concerning. It's not to say that it's not concerning that someone can go on, you know, Discord or Twitch or whatever. Uh, but it's it's a much smaller audience, and the as a result, the ability to weaponize a community is is, is smaller. And, and remember that many of the people with these channels uh, who are spewing hate um, are monetized, start monetizing it, and and earning millions and millions of dollars. They're not doing it just to evangelize, they're doing it to get rich. Um, and, uh, and I think if the profit motive was taken away, um, which of course you can't really say, okay, you know, you can make a profit, you can't. Um, it, it, makes it, it makes it very, very hard because you can monetize it to a greater extent um, on YouTube than, than anywhere else. So that's why YouTube is so important. We, have, uh, we are running out of time, uh, but I'm very happy that we have, we have so a fruitful uh, conversation. We have uh, one more question, question over there. And, oh, it's a comment, okay. There are a lot of these smaller 
think it's the it's about to the point where where um, you have uh, people in Macedonia who political scheme here is a lot more different than America, but they're getting these these arguments that uh, from these uh, uh, right wing political funds in America who <coughs> have the funding, who who have the resources to make up all of these sort of um, arguments and everything, uh, so they can just take it. Where, uh, and I also like the fact that you added people like Natalie Wynn with like people on the left and everything. What I've also noticed is you can have people on the left here to, to spread uh, that sort of uh, information. So uh, I feel like it's it's working a bit grim here in this sort of aspect. I just wanted to add. Well, thank you. And and Alex, do you want to chat a bit about Natalie? I I, I don't know if people are aware of, of her very principled position in all of this. Yeah, I mean, I think anyone who's trans, who's public right now is in a tough spot. And uh, there's a very, very strong, very financially supported, as you just said, um, anti-trans movement uh, globally, and it's very strong in the US. Um, and people like Natalie are getting a lot of death threats and having to lay low, and mm. she's had to lay pretty low in certain ways. Um, uh, they're you know, still active, but being hyper cautious. And I have other trans uh, friends who are public or journalists or whatever who are facing a lot of death threats at the moment. Um, and and Twitter is, is sort of aggressively anti trans or whatever he's calling it these days. And uh, um, and has made that that space not only unsafe for trans, but a kind of an active and and um, supported uh, community for anti trans and inciting rhetoric. So. I agree with you. I think things are, are pretty dire um, in, in some ways and probably will get worse before they get better. Uh, but I also think there are, I do think there's an enormous population that are very pro all of these marginalized groups that realize they have to get active um, and they can't just sit on their hands and not vote, not get involved, not be engaged. Um, and that gives me a lot of hope. So hopefully spread the word because you know, people here can watch Contrapoint um, and, and, and see that, uh, you know, this is, we, we need more things to bring us together and not divide us. And, and, and sadly, we're in a world that is able to monetize division and, um, you know, and, and where diversity is something to fear as opposed to embrace. And I, I really think it's your generation um that hopefully can can change things because i'm sorry but mine screwed up terribly yeah. uh, destroyed the planet you know uh and uh so we're we're counting we're counting <laughs> on you it's the big burden but um but i i have confidence uh, thanks for uh, the, localizing the uh, the situation here in uh, in uh, macedonia so what's next for YouTube and for global politics? Having in mind the things that you uh, pointed in the in the uh, documentary. I, I will I will defer to Alex. What's next in terms of YouTube? Or? Yes, yes, YouTube and pol global politics. Having in mind oh, the era of disinformation. <laughs> disinformation. <laughs> I think I mean I can't speak for geopolitics any better than any of you can, but. Uh, YouTube is definitely going to be, the, the landscape is going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, we are in desperate need of guardrails, um, and it's not going to happen fast, unfortunately. As much as everybody wants it to, there's no way to quickly enforce the internet. Um, and especially because we've been asleep at the wheel for the last two decades. So we have a lot of catching up to do. Um, but that's not... You know, that's not a negative thing. There's a lot of really smart people in this space working on ways to make this space better. So it's not to say it's doom and gloom. It's just to say it's going to take a minute. You know, and, and Alex especially and uh, I, to a lesser extent, are now talking about, you know, what would that, what would legislation be that would quote unquote break the internet, but could help create guardrails um, that uh, that will improve the experience. Mm -hmm. um, so you know that's that's something that that we are doing. That's you know we're not getting paid to be here. Um, we we've done all of the marketing uh, for this ourselves. We have no marketing budget, but it's because we're passionate. Because 
what the world shares is the internet. And more and more, that's where everyone gets their information. And, and I think it's important to know who the trusted sources are and, um, and to have counter programming. Um, Twitter's really become uh, very much Elon Musk's plaything. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 it is working to weaponize even more so because there is an agenda behind it. I, I think that with, I don't think that YouTube actually has an agenda. Um, it's what makes money for them. With, with Elon, it goes beyond that. Because clearly, he's taken something that he paid $40 billion for and now worth eight, maybe less. So, uh, so it's clearly not about monetization in this, in this uh, uh, if, it were a public, if it were a public company, uh, you know, his shareholders would, would be in, in revolt. Okay. Uh, that could be a conclusion of, yes. our, yeah, of uh, our panel uh, tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, for joining us in a different Thank time zone. So <laughs> I appreciate it. I hope that we'll see each Thank other you. here in our country. Thank you, Gail, uh, for your coming in Macedonia. We'll continue tomorrow uh, in Stip. Yeah. And I hope that we'll have, uh, this, uh, once again, a very inspirited people over there who will watch the movie and uh, we can have this kind of a, a conversation. And, and by the way, it is, it's, it is available now to view uh, on Vimeo. So if you can't stay to finish it, because it seems like a lot of people couldn't, <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it is available now. Um, uh, and if you go to our website, um, YouTube Effect, um, if you just ha ha Google it. <laughs> yeah, yteffect.com. I have to go. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Recording uh, stopped. You'll be able to see it. And spread the word. That's the weapon. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much once again. <laughs>